Good morning. So good to be here. Another beautiful Lord's Day. And good to have visitors. Thank you for choosing to be with us this morning. You are an encouragement to us. We know that you're possibly here for work or vacation. And you've decided that God will come first and you will find God's people and and be with his family to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so thank you for being here, for encouraging our church family. Good to see you all. I hope that everyone's having a, a good week. Well, you should have a good week. Given the beginning of our week, we start with giving God the praise and glory that is due to him. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Acts. And we're studying the book of Acts, but before we get to the study um, for our visitors, right after our uh, morning worship, we're going to do a recognition ceremony for all of our graduates this year. And then right after that ceremony, we'll go down to, to uh, our fellowship hall downstairs and enjoy a, a fellowship meal. So you're welcome uh, to join us for that as well. That's our uh, monthly potluck. But the theme today is to honor uh, our graduates, all those who graduated um, this year. And one of the things that we're excited about is graduating our first uh, new converts uh, graduates since we started a new converts class. And, and um uh, I'm encouraged to, to see that happening, and we look forward to that class growing, the new converts class um, to grow. And, and I know we, we had many new converts last year, 27 in total. And so um, this year we're graduating three. And so I want to encourage our new converts uh, to sign up and, and join this class I don't remember being in a new converts class, but I know what it was like to be freshly baptized, if you will, to obey the gospel, and then to sort of be left alone to figure things out on my own. And part of the new converts class is to, you know, reteach some of the things you learn in Bible study but also to lay the foundation of faith, right? You don't become faithful coming out of the water. <laughs> you don't become faithful coming out of the water of baptism. Many have been baptized and walked away from the Lord. You become faithful by the training and the discipline and the studying of God's word. And that's where a new converts class comes in. And our elders are, are leading in that class, so, um, and rightly so, because they have the experience and, and the years of, of walking in the faith. They are the likely candidates to answer questions that arise um, that may be challenging for a person who is new in the faith. But we are, oh, before we get to our study, I almost forgot our bookmark. See, I forget sometimes. But take out your bookmark. Again, for our visitors' sake, what we do in our evangelism efforts, part of our evangelism efforts is this bookmark. What we do with it is we write 10 names of people that, in our, that are in our circle of influence people that we can reach and we write their names on the, on the card. And this card stays in our Bible. And whenever we open our Bible and that card is there, we remember to pray for those names and we pray for their names specifically. Uh, we pray for opportunities to teach them the gospel. And then we also prepare ourselves to be that vessel through which uh, this person can be led uh, to Christ. And I always emphasize those names on that bookmark, we as individuals, I am responsible 
for sharing the gospel to these names on here. And, and so uh, likewise, each of our members who is doing the bookmark, I'm not sure if everyone's doing it, um, but pray for those names. And so what I'd like to do for us this morning is to lead us in a prayer for the names on our bookmark. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for blessing us with another day in life. We thank you so much, Father, for the many blessings that you rain down upon us. The food, the clothing, the water, the air that we breathe. And the blessing of living here in Hawaii. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for your great son, Jesus. And the sacrifice that he made so that we can be saved from our sins. And Father, we're so thankful for the people that you put in our lives that help us understand your word, that help us to come to the knowledge of the truth and to obey the gospel. And we pray a blessing for them, Lord, that you continue to give them good health and strength and boldness of faith so they can continue uh, to win more souls to Christ. But also, Lord, we want to do the same. For we know, Father, that you've called us to preach the gospel to every creature, to go into the world, and to lead others to Christ. And so help us, Lord, to be the salt and the light of this world. Help us to lead many souls to Jesus. And so, Father, we pray specifically for the names on each of our bookmarks. Help us, Lord, to have the wisdom and the knowledge to teach them the truth. Help us to recognize when the opportunities uh, arise for, for us to do so. And we pray, Father, for tender hearts, for good soil, for the seed to be planted. Thank you so much, Father, for your word. And be with us now as we open your holy word to learn more about your will to apply it in our lives and share it to others. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you take that bookmark, put it back in your Bible, and then open with me to Acts chapter 7. We are in Acts chapter 7, and the section of the text is verse 44 to 50. Just to give us a background again of Acts chapter 7, um, Stephen is the one preaching this lesson, and he's giving a defense for the faith because these Judaizers or these Jews who uh, persecuted him are, are, are bringing false accusations against Stephen like they did Jesus. And so Stephen stands up before this council and he gives them a historical lesson, a lesson on the history of the Jewish people. And it is his way to connect with them. They are his people. He's a Jew himself. It is his way to show to them that the law, the purpose of the law was to point to Jesus, like Paul said in Galatians 3 and verse 24, for, for the law was our schoolmaster to point us to Christ. And that's the whole purpose of this summary. Stephen is trying to convince the Jew that, hey, all of the past from Abraham to Moses to the prophets, all of the past was about bringing about Messiah. And that law points to Messiah and we have killed Messiah. And so we know the end of this account. It's a familiar account that after Stephen preaches the truth, he dies. The Jews stoned him for preaching the truth. And so going through this summary of the Old Testament, there are certain lessons that, that we can learn from it. 
All right. Uh, Paul said about the Old Testament in Romans chapter 14, uh, in Romans 15 and verse 4, sorry. In Romans 15 and verse 4, Paul said, For whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so in other words, Paul was saying that the Old Testament teaches us, right? That though we don't live under the law, that the law of Moses is not our covenant law, our covenant law is the law of Christ in the spirit. Though we don't live under the Old Testament, we can still learn from the Old Testament. And that's sort of our approach to this sermon about the Old Testament or the summary of the Old Testament by Stephen. And so I like to read for us verse 44 through 50, and then we'll come back and, and highlight some main thoughts here from this section. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove before the face of our fathers until the days of David who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Oh, what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? All right, and so the, the summary picks up very quickly from Moses and Sinai to the wanderings and now highlighting the tabernacle, right? The tabernacle, another name for the tent, right? And in that tent, there was the Ark of the Covenant, which God instruct Moses, we see that in, in the book of Exodus, which God instruct Moses to build precisely according to what God said uh, uh, to be the design of it. Measure it this long, this wide, this high. Make it with this type of material. And yes, Moses and the priest and those who were given the talent to make the tabernacle and, and the things of the tabernacle, they build it according to God's instructions. And there is our first point of application. Do things the way God says to do it. All right. Do things the way God says to do it. Imagine if... Moses decided to build the tabernacle his way, right? Well, we, we know for sure that if that was the case, Moses won't even be in the, in the wanderings in the wilderness with God's people. We know that he would be like the sons of Aaron who perished because they did something that God did not command or God did not instruct. Again, go with me to Leviticus chapter 10. All right, again, point of application. As Stephen brings up this highlight of, of history, he reminds them that God commanded Moses to make everything according to the pattern or according to the instructions that God said to do it. And the book of Leviticus is filled with instructions for the priest. Detailed instructions, right? Another uh, uh, way to think about our application here is, is this question. Do the details matter to God? All right, that's a good question. Does it matter to God what he said? 
And the, the answer we know, oh, absolutely. The details matter. Look at this incident here in Leviticus chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. So again, giving the background, Nadab and Abihu are sons of the high priest. Right? They were two of four sons of Aaron. And they had just offered to God worship that, ex that was acceptable to God. We see that in, in chapter 9. They, they offered the worship according to God's commands. But then here in Leviticus chapter 10, we see them go beyond the commandments of God. Or we see them venture into things that God never said to do. And yes, that matters. Right? It matters when God is silent. It matters. The restoration plea, if you are familiar with the restoration in, uh, of Christianity, the movements involved, one of the restoration plea was to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. And that is another way of saying, do things the way God said to do it. All right. Now notice here, Nadab and Abihu, sons of the high priest, who should know better and have been instructed of what to do. Verse 1, Leviticus 10, verse 1. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord. Now here's the key. Which he, that is God, which he had not commanded them. All right. So it's something that God did not say to do, and they did it. Right? In other words, uh, God was silent about this, but they reasoned in their minds. I don't know what their thought process were, but it would be the parallel of this thought. Well, God didn't say not to. <laughs> right? That would be the parallel idea here. Well, there's no commandment in the Bible that says you can't smoke ice. There's no, no such thing. There's no commandment in the Bible. You, you go down the, the various things that are sinful that the Bible does not specifically or explicitly address. Right? There are no direct commands, take for example, against cocaine. So is it okay to do cocaine? Right? Now, there are other commands that one might call the, an umbrella command. Here's a command that cocaine would violate, right? We're commanded to be what? To be sober, right? And you think about everything that falls under, uh, 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 that could violate being sober, being drunk with wine, being under the influence, being high off of something. When you're not sober, you violate that, that command, right? So there are those umbrella commands. And so the, the point I'm trying to emphasize is when God is silent about something, it doesn't mean it is okay for us to do it, right? Here, Nadab and Abihu offered some incense to God, strange fire, some translations would say, and God had not commanded. And what was the consequence for their disobedience? What was the consequence for their presumptuous sin? Right? To, to presume, well, maybe, you know, he never commanded this, but it's still okay. We're still offering something to God. It's still okay. Must be okay with God. What was the consequence? Well, verse 2. So fire went out 
from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Right. Leaders of the nation, spiritual guides of the people, Nadab and Abihu. Right. Sometimes uh, when there are problems, we tend to say, well, if there's a problem in the organization, look at the what? Look at who? The leaders. <laughs> look at the leaders. Right? Here you have leaders. Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, disobeying God. And the consequence for their action was death. Does it matter to God how to offer incense to him under the old covenant? What would be the answer to that? Does it matter? Yes. Several other examples. I won't belabor the point, but several other examples. Remember um, Uzzah? What did Uzzah do when <laughs> When God struck him dead, what? Why did God struck him dead? He touched the ark with his hands. Right. Again, here in Leviticus, and also in Numbers, God gave instructions on how to transport the ark. All right, sons of Aaron were to bear the ark. On their shoulders, using the, the 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 poles or the sticks that they were instructed to carry the ark of God. What did David do? He made a new cart. All right, you gotta appreciate the intention. All right, all right. This is the Lord's ark. Let's let's not just bring an old cart and put the ark on there. <laughs> Right? Let's build a new one. All right? so, so at least there's that respect for the ark. Right? The intentions are good. Let's build a new one. It's the Lord's ark. And they put it on there. And they transported the ark. And it became unstable to where it was going to fall. And Uzzah reached out. Good intentions, right? W would you say he had good intentions? Yes. It's the Ark of the Covenant. Don't let it touch the dirt on the ground. All right? It's sort of like uh, reminded of my dad telling us, don't let that Bible be on the floor. <laughs> you drop your Bible, you pick it up, you dust it off, and you kiss it. That's what, that's what my dad told us. You know, and his idea was you got to respect the Bible. Treated such a way, right? Well, Uzzah didn't want the ark of God to get dirty or to hit the ground. It was God's ark. Good intentions. But he died. Do the details matter? Does it matter how God commands to do something? Well, absolutely. That's why Stephen highlights that in the sermon. He commanded Moses to make things according to the pattern. Are there patterns of commands for us to follow in the New Testament? Yes. Right. God is a God of patterns. If you look throughout the Bible, there are so many patterns in the theology that, and, uh, that the Bible shares. There's patterns in numbers. There's patterns in designs. You talk about antitypes and types, right? There are shadows of the Old Testament that point it to Jesus. And there are patterns of that throughout the Old Testament. He's a God of patterns. Does it matter how we worship God in the new covenant? Did God change his mind? Like from the Old Testament, he was so strict with his word. And all of a sudden in the New Testament, he's a little loose with his word there. He's not as strict 
in the New Testament. How many of us have heard that? The God of the Old Testament, he's mean and, and angry and, 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 and demanding. The God of the New Testament, he's more graceful. How, how many of us have heard that? There's, there's so many that have that idea about God and the Bible. In the Old Testament, he's mean and angry. He's the same God. He's the same gracious God that flooded the whole earth and saved only eight souls. As a matter of fact, the first time we see the word grace there in the Bible was concerning that flood. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's the same God. And so there are commands in the New Testament that we must follow. Take, for example, the pattern of our worship. When we worship God, Jesus made that very clear. Go with me to John chapter 4. <clears throat> John chapter 4, and notice beginning in verse 20. All right. During this time of the first century, uh, coming from the Old Testament, coming from the time of the restoration from Babylon, throughout that process of time to the time of, of what we're about to read, this context of Jesus and the women at, and the woman at the well, the Samaritans had a certain mountain that they would go up and worship. All right. The Samaritans were half Jews. And so their ancestors commanded them that they should worship on this mountain. The pure Jews, right? There was always that, that division between the Jews and the Samaritans. The pure Jews would say, well, no. God's on our mountain. Jerusalem, Zion. There we worship God. And so in this conversation with the woman at the well, she asked Jesus about worship. All right, because she she understood that okay, he's a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We're we're trying to worship the same God, but we worship on this mountain, they on that mountain, and she's familiar with the history of the Jews. And so she asked Jesus, right, in verse 20, John 4, beginning verse 20. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Notice what Jesus said to her. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. All right? And so Jesus said, there's going to be a change. There comes a point when the worshipers don't have to make pilgrimage to Zion. Where the worshipers don't have to go there to keep the mandatory feasts of the Old Testament. If that was still the case, we're doing it wrong today. <laughs> right? We should be going to Jerusalem and keeping those mandatory feasts. But Jesus says there's going to be a change. You won't be worshiping God on this mountain. There will be no worship to God on Zion. That will not be the place of worship. The place of worship will be the church. The temple of God. All right. And so he says to her, you worship what you do not know. There is such a thing as ignorance worship or worship in ignorance. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must. What an important word there concerning patterns. All right? The pattern of our worship must be this way must be in spirit, the right attitude, all right? That's what that word 
is communicating in spirit, right? When you're at a certain game, um, I like sports, and you're cheering on your team, and maybe they're losing, and then they make a play and they come back, and you might say something like, that's the spirit, or that's the attitude. That's the idea of this word, All right? Some say we must worship him, the Holy Spirit. No, the word here is attitude. Now, is the Holy Spirit involved in our worship? Absolutely. We worship him, All right? We worship the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Son. They are all God. But here, spirit means attitude. Does it matter to God how we come to our gathering place? Yes. Have you ever come to worship mad, angry? I have. <laughs> I know I have. All right. Preacher told a, uh, a story husband and wife prepping for Sunday morning worship at the house there's arguments getting the kids ready getting the food ready we're late you're, you're not getting ready yet and there's arguments and on the way to church still arguing in the car and the kids are watching of course and as soon as the car is parked the windows are still down and a certain sister walks up to the to the car window and say, good morning, the change of attitude. Oh, good morning, sister so-and-so. <laughs> a change of attitude, right? We can change our attitude. Uh, it matters to God how we come to worship. Thanksgiving is a good attitude. Coming to be thankful. I don't have to worship. I get to worship God. All right. uh, attitude of humility. All right. uh, coming to worship. Humble by our sins. Humble by his grace. Humble that we survive some possible tragedy. I'll tell you what, you survive a car accident. That was my very first accident. Still a little bit shook from it. I was on a long drive yesterday. I had felt some anxiety driving from here to where he was. Kind of, I was kind of anxious a little bit. Still kind of nervous on the road. Eventually, it will wear, it will wear off. I think. But you survive tragedy. You 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 become so thankful to the Lord. Your attitude changes about things in life. Attitude matters. Jesus said, you must have the right attitude coming before God. Recognizing who he is. Psalm 100. For he has made us and not we ourselves. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Into his courts with praise. Be thankful to the Lord for he is good. And we are the sheep of his pasture. All right. How can I have a proper attitude when I come to worship? Well, prayer helps. The word of God helps. A lot of the uh, Psalms in, in the book of Psalms, a lot of those Psalms, they put you in the right state of mind. Maybe Sunday morning you're mad, you're angry, or you're overload. Read one of those psalms before you come to worship. Go put your mind in the right state of mind. Or say a prayer. Put your mind in the right state of mind. Go ahead, Ren. Uh, for, for us, uh, th there are times when it uh, our, our love of going to worship becomes cooled, uh, cold down or you know, not, not so much warm anymore. And and that's true, but it should not be. 
unless we surpass the attitude of one going to a job interview, we're not coming to worship the right, the right way. You know, coming into a job interview, you, there, there are things you consider, but if you consider more coming to worship, um, consider less coming to worship, your worship is in vain. I want to add to what Ren says because doesn't doesn't um arriving on time to worship God says something about attitude? It it does, doesn't it? Or how I view now, you know, there are circumstances where you might be late because of a car accident. Right. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, when we are able and have the ability to come to God, worship him, to be on time, right? It's so distracting to try and worship or even try to preach. And I preach on Sundays and people show up during the show, the sermon. And I don't know what their circumstances was, but if they were able to be on time and they decide to come in that, that late in worship, does that say something about their attitude? Absolutely. All right. And so so just wanted to add a thought there um, to what Ren is, is saying. So pattern, right? We're talking about pattern, and you have this word must. Jesus says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in right attitude, in spirit. And then the other component is truth. You can have the right attitude and then do the wrong thing. All right, like Nadab and Abihu. Well, that's not a good example. <laughs> Basically, you can be genuine and sincere in showing up to worship God. And your heart is in it. But then you do things that are not according to the pattern of worship that we see in the New Testament. That latter part, in spirit and in truth, in the right attitude and doing the things that God has said to do. All right. And so in, in our worship, all right, we we say we have five acts of worship. And sometimes that idea of five acts of worship is frowned upon because it's a list. It's a number of things. And some people just don't like the idea of list and numbers. And, and so... They will find ways to be creative and worship God in a way they would want, in a way they think it will be pleasing to God. But when we look at the New Testament, uh, the pattern of our worship, one of the main things that we see that the Christians did when they gathered on the first day of the week, uh, one of the main things was they observed the Lord's Supper. Acts 20 and verse 7. All right. They were together the first day of the week. They were breaking bread, observing the Lord's Supper, what Jesus commanded, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Grape juice, not wine. All right. <laughs> wine comes from the grape, but there's something in wine that during the week of unleavened of the week of unleavened, it wasn't there. What did the people or the Jewish people do during the week of unleavened? Of unleavened? They cleared their house of, of, of leaven. In other words, anything with yeast, food or drink, clear their house. And so when Jesus instituted the supper, it was, it was, those emblems that he used, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Now, how many of us are aware that there are churches that don't even observe the Lord's Supper? Yeah. All right. They'll pass out the collection plate every Sunday. <laughs> well, let's observe the Lord's Supper. 
right? Or how many churches will pass out the collection plate every Sunday and observe the Lord's Supper one Sunday of the month? You familiar with that practice? Yeah. All right. The pattern that we see is on the first day of the week. That means every Sunday we observe the Lord's Supper. It's not because of our preference. It's not because we decided, you know what? We should do this every first day of the week. No, it's because the word of God has a pattern. The Christians did that. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 42. Acts chapter 20, and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 11, we always read it. Verse 23 and onward. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And then there's preaching, right? We notice that the church, when they gathered there in Acts 20, Paul preached. He preached the word. Preached till midnight. All right? Maybe we should try that sometime. I'm kidding. But as God's people, we should love the preaching of God's word. We should love to hear the word of God preach. And it should hurt us when the word is not preached. Right? It was preaching. Paul to Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. But the time will come that we will not endure sound doctrine. Why do we need to preach? Every time we gather, why should the word be preached every time we gather? Well, preaching instructs us, teaches us of God's word. It encourages us. It corrects us, right? That's usually not our favorite thing about preaching. When the preacher preaches something and, and you're sitting in the pew and you're like, how did he know about my trouble? He, he wasn't following you. <laughs> he didn't know about your trouble. It's the word of God. It hurts because the word of God can do that. It cuts. It hurts sometimes. And rightly so. In preaching, we are encouraged. We are instructed. We are corrected. And in preaching, we glorify God. Um. I don't ever want to be a preacher that makes preaching about me. And, and I will strive for that. I will, I, I, and you got to help me watch out for them. Because there, there, there are preachers that make the preaching about them and not about the word of God. In worship, there's the Lord's Supper. In worship, there's preaching. Worship. There's praying, right? There's praying, the pattern of our worship. Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 42. When the church was established on the day of Pentecost, which meant 50th day, and the 50th day from um, the 50th day, which is Pentecost, fell on the first day of the week. The church was established. Jesus arose on the first day of the week. The church was established on the first day of the week. And so we worship on the first day of the week. All right? There's And then there's patterns in the New Testament. They gathered on the first day of the week. So there's a, an accusation uh, against those who worship on Sunday that the reason why we worship on Sunday is because of an edict made by uh, Emperor Constantine way back when. But we see that the Christians, way before he came to exist, Christians were gathered on the first day of the week. Here in the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, and verse 42, then they continue steadfastly. Who are the day? They that were baptized and added to the number of the church. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, doctrine in their preaching. In the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, in prayers, 
We pray when we come to worship. It doesn't say how many times we should pray. It says we should be praying. All right. And in our congregation, we pray several times in our worship. All right. Sometimes in the beginning or or uh, right after two songs, we always pray in the opening prayer. We pray for the Lord's Supper as Jesus did. Uh, sometimes I would lead a prayer, especially when my heart is heavy and trying to preach a, a sermon. I need a prayer. I need to pray for the sermon and pray for myself to deliver it. And then we offer prayers at the end uh, during our invitation. We pray. We observe the Lord's Supper. We preach. We pray. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is a priority. Sec, uh, 1 Timothy 2 uh, someone read verse 1 through 4. Prayer is a priority for the church. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Paul says, Timothy, first of all, priority, first of all, pray. There are various prayers. There are supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving us of thanks. We we in our prayer we thank God. In our prayers we praise God. In our prayers we ask God. Um, we thank God. We praise God. We ask God. Uh, and when we ask God, we ask for healing. Or we ask for guidance or protection. Prayer is a priority. And the church of the first century prayed often. And so should we. That's the pattern that we see in worship. And then there's singing. Do a little bit of uh, digging in history. Many of the churches that exist today, take for example, the Methodist church. Those who now or have created a Lutheran church. Um, the various older churches, not the new charismatic, new hope type of church, but the churches that are in history. There was a long period of time when in their worship, they just sang a cappella. Uh, there are quotes from various leaders, uh, famous commentators that share how they disagree with the idea of instruments in worship. Um, the Methodist founder, if you will, was one, among those who comment on the use of instruments in the Methodist church. Didn't like it. So for a long time of his, in history, the worship of the community of Christians, and I want to say community of Christians, because we know from the time of the apostles to like about 500 AD when the first instrument was introduced into worship, that in that span of time, there was already division among believers. So I say among the community of worship uh, of Christians. Right? There was no instrument used in worship. Now, why is that? Well, because the early Christians sang songs. They patterned their worship 
similar to how they worship God in the synagogues. And in the synagogues of old, there were no instruments. When Paul went to the synagogue, what was his goal there? He went there to convince those who worship there to follow God. So Paul didn't have to say, don't use instruments when he went there, because there were none. Were there instruments in the first century? Absolutely. But they weren't used in the worship of the church. And to add to it, because sometimes we'll, people will use Psalm 150. Go there with me. Here's a, and there are various Psalms. Notice verse 3. Praise him with the sound of trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And often this psalm is used to say, it says there to praise the Lord with instruments. But then we know that if we rightly divide the word, what, what part is the psalms? Is it under the new covenant or the old covenant? The psalms are the old covenant. Jesus confirmed that in Luke chapter 24. When he said to them, all the things written of me in the Psalms, in the writings, in the prophets, in the law of Moses. Right? Have you ever bought a Bible, only the New Testament, and at the end of that Bible, there's the book of Psalms? Do you have that Bible? I have a Bible like that. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's my wedding Bible because it's nice and small. But the Psalms are not there because it's part of the New Testament. <laughs> but some people conclude that. Oh, well, the, aren't the Psalms in the New Testament? I mean, there's a Bible that has the Psalms right after the book of Revelation. No, the Psalms are part of the Old Testament. And you talk about God's silence when it comes to worship and the New Testament. There's not a single instant in the worship of the church in the New Testament where we see the use of instruments or mechanical instruments. Because we see that we're commanded to sing. All right. Ephesians chapter uh, 5, verse 19. Colossians 3 and verse 16. Uh, Hebrews, let us continue to offer to him the praise, the fruit of our lips. Sing songs of praise to God. Jesus, after instituting the Lord's Supper, the Bible says there that he sung a hymn with his disciples. And he went and they went out into the garden. Right. So we sing. Right. The Bible is just silent. On the instruments. And I say if it was up to me. I would love for us to have some instruments. It will spice things up. But they often take away. The attention from God. And worship. You look at the places where instruments are used. The stage. Is the audience. The people sit there and listen and look and be in awe of the performance on the stage. When we sing, we are singing to the Lord. Doesn't matter if you're off tune. <laughs> All right? It'd be nice to be on tune, but it doesn't matter if you're off tune. It's the words and the disposition 
of your heart. That is music to the ears of God. All right. We're told to sing and make melody where? In our hearts to the Lord. And there's that Greek word salo there in those commands. Some uh, uh, some dictionary says that's a song, salo. Um, but the Greek word there, salo, means to pluck the strings of an instrument. Right? To sing and make salo. And then what follows is the instrument. To sing and to pluck the strings of the heart to the Lord. Not the harp, the heart. Right? In other words, you make music to God in your heart. And so we sing and worship. That's why we do it. Uh, I've had many cases where several of our visitors have asked me afterwards, why is there no piano? Right? And I would say, we make music in the heart. We want to sing to the Lord as we have been commanded. And then last but not least in our worship, we give. We give to God. We give as a cheerful giver. We don't tithe. <laughs> tithing is of the Old Testament. And tithing is like one of the ways churches abuse their members. Uh, you must give 10%. <laughs> And you want to ask them, where do you get this 10% from? From in the Old Testament, okay? But if we look closely in the Old Testament, when the Jews gave to God, it was more like 60%. <laughs> they gave a lot of things. They gave of the first fruits of their increase. They gave the first of their cattle. <laughs> they gave to the Lord. When, when David uh, uh, wanted to build the temple and, 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 and call on God's people to give to the Lord, oh, they came giving to build the temple. Right? We, don't, we don't follow 10% demand. The scriptures tell us, let each one decide. In his heart, what he wants to give. And it's according to what one has, not on what one does not have. And we give, according to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and verse 2, as God has prospered us. And the main key component of our giving is we give cheerfully. The Bible says, for God loves a cheerful giver. Doesn't matter the amount. The disposition of heart matters to God. Right. Now I say it doesn't matter the amount. But if I make a lot of money and I only give a penny, <laughs> am I being a cheerful, am I really being a cheerful giver? There's something about cheerful giving that we often ignore. Those who love to give, they will give. Right? They will not withhold. They give cheerfully. And I don't know if you have sat down and tested uh, this uh, law of God. But one of the parts that we read about giving is that he who sows sparingly will also what? Reap sparingly. Have you ever tested that? <laughs> Let me see if I'm going to increase my giving. Let me see what happens. Right. Did God say to... Uh, uh, through the prophet Malachi. Bring the offering to me as I commanded to you. 
Test me now in this, and I will rain down blessings from heaven that your storehouses cannot even hold them. I'm not, I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel here. <laughs> but for some reason, we have ignored that part about God's law of sowing and reaping. The Bible says that God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Test him. Shared a story um, when we were at preaching school. And really the switch from the lovely insurance that we have here in Hawaii to that of what they have in Tennessee, I had to pay for insulin out of pocket because it took a while for our insurance to, to kick in. And I had to apply for the free insurance there in, in Tennessee, just couldn't afford insurance. And the price of insulin was two fifty a vial. And at that time, uh, my going rate was three vials a month. So you do the math. This is expensive. Uh, anyways, um, thank God we had supporters. Right? Our church supported us. Several others supported us. Some of you individual families supported us on top of our church supporting us. And, and, and we're forever grateful for that. We had supporters. And then at a certain time, one of our supporters just couldn't support us. It happens. Things happen and and people just can't give as they normally could. And and we were we're still thankful. And Athena and I, we had decided we're gonna give this amount to God while we are here in Memphis. Well, I won't share the amount, but when we lost a supporter. All right, we were kind of in a crisis financially, and and it it, it was really a test, <laughs> really a test of faith. Uh, um, we lost like six hundred dollars monthly. That's a lot. You lose six hundred dollars monthly, you can't pay your car, <laughs> you can't pay its insurance. Um, maybe you miss out on several trips to McDonald's here in Hawaii. <laughs> Right, six hundred dollars is a lot of money, and and one of our supporters uh, couldn't couldn't help, and so it had entered in our conversation. Should we cut back on the giving? Right, and we thought about it. I said no. Right, we said we were going to give this amount to God, so we we kept giving the same amount. Um, sacrifice elsewhere or or just kind of went uh, you know with without certain things that you don't really need and then not long after losing that supporter a certain church offered a preaching opportunity to me for me and you know I was in preaching school I figured this would be great for for me, I get to preach every Sunday. I get to practice, right? Get to get some sermons in and and uh, come to Honolulu a little bit more polished. Uh, I get to help that congregation because they were really going to close their doors because they had had a preacher for a long time. And so the job offer was to me and two other students. And this church ended up with three preachers. Had three preachers. A uh, small church in the middle of nowhere, but they had a lot of money. And God just doubled what we lost. <laughs> and I was like, praise God, you know. The law of sowing and reaping, it applies in our giving. That's why it's there. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. God, God will take care of us. Uh, Lillian, you will have... Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> but in our worship, right, the pattern, as, as Stephen brings before the Jews, there's a pattern that Moses did things according. And so a reminder for us, there's a pattern that we follow. 
in our worship. And, and we must worship God in spirit and in truth. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word and the reminder today, Lord, of why we do things the way that we do it. And Father, please forgive us when we fail to follow the pattern that you've given to us. We love you and we want to keep your commandments. And so help us, Lord, to walk humbly and faithfully before you. Thank you for all that you do for us, especially for giving us a Savior. Be with us now, Lord, as we prepare our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. May everything we say, do, and think glorify your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.